شكرا جزيلا لإتاحة هذه الفرصة أنا هيوى عثمان من شبكة 964 الإخبارية لا أعتقد أن هناك أي داعي أو أي مسبب لتقديم سعادة السفيرة I'll switch to English in a minute you don't I'm just doing the introductions سعادة السفيرة طبعا من إحدى أهم الشخصيات الموجودة في المشهد العراقي في السنوات الثلاثة الماضية أعتقد وأتمنى أن تكون هذه المحادثة تضع بعض الضوء على بعض القضايا التي لا نراها في تغريداتها المستمرة والتي نغطيها في تسعة ستة أربعة uh, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Uh, thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, I hope we can have a conversation that can make some news <laughs> as a journalist. And uh, uh, we, we follow at 964 your tweets uh, very carefully. But there are always certain things that we do not see or do not read um, for obvious reasons or understandably in your tweets that we would like and your statements we would like to see here or to, to learn more about. Uh, let me start with the elephant in the room or the elephant in the region. Uh, the U.S. is known to be a leading human rights advocate, and you've had some stances in the past. Uh, and the Iraqi elite in general, we are talking about uh, an Iraq-US relationship, a lasting US relationship, that is 360. Some of them say, we can't afford to do 360. It is 180 and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, in my next question maybe. But right now, the Iraqi elite understands the importance of a continued and a long-lasting relationship with the United States. But what they are perplexed or baffled with is that the US stands from atrocities in the region, starting from the atrocities of Saddam in the 80s, all the way to what we are seeing in Gaza today. What do you say to our elite? Well, first of all, I want to thank very much uh, the organizers of the Mary Forum. You know, every year they bring um, hundreds, and I see it's a packed room today, hundreds of people uh, to come and hear from um, many, from diplomats, from government officials, from senior leaders, from um, deep thinkers of the situation both here and in the region. Uh, and I'm very pleased that I can be here today, uh, today and again this year to uh, participate in a dialogue that I think is very important and that, you know, advances the knowledge and the thinking of, uh, of, uh, of many here in Iraq and around the region. So, um, so thanks a lot for, for putting this together. I'm sort of looking at Luar, but he's not, he may be back there doing his organizational things. Um, so um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, the role of the United States and our 360 relationship uh, here in Iraq and what we're trying to build that absolutely con uh, continues and has a very important um, human rights component to it. Um, as you can imagine, 360, not 180, 360 is we do everything. We, uh, we want to uh, move the relationship that we have had um, for the past decades or so from a very heavily focused security relationship to one that really puts uh, equal weight, maybe even more weight, on things like trade and energy, uh, human rights, 
governance, uh, building a private sector, um, supporting um, the aspirations of uh, the Iraqi people, especially women and youth, in terms of building their future. Uh, there have been significant changes, uh, I think, over the past uh, two, three years. And I think, you know, the United States, as you called us, the big elephant in the room. There are the other... The region. There, but there are other big elephants in the room. Of course. Um, and in the region. And hence, our 180, so, my statement about 180, not 360. Um, and so, I, uh, I, I'm, I've been very... Um, I think fortunate to serve in Iraq here over the past uh, two, two and a half years to help really advance our relationship um, in, the, in these areas that are covered, frankly, and have been covered in the uh, strategic uh, framework sure. agreement, which is still very much a, f a framework and agreement that we and the government of Iraq believe is still very useful in charting and setting our, um, our, our relationship. Um, and so this is kind of where we are right now. And it's been really important. I can get into a lot of other details. Right. but um, and, and frankly, to your point about um, the situation in the region overall, uh, being able to open up that aperture uh, to talk with the government of Iraq and uh, the people of Iraq uh, about the situation in the region is really important. And we've been able to do that. Um, those are, um, it's been a difficult um, uh, uh, issues here that countries in the region have grappled with to include Iraq, but it's been very much part of our political and diplomatic engagement to talk about um, the region and how we ensure that this region doesn't find itself um, either intentionally or unintentionally in a, in a war. Let's stop it. Thank you. Did you see the Israeli planes flying over Iraq to Iran? Did I see the Israeli planes? Did, did you see the Israeli did planes the, flying? The embassy. <laughs> did you see them? Did the embassy see them? That's my question. <laughs> You're supposed Look, to be the United States. The United States is, did not participate in this in in the uh, in the uh, Israeli uh, the Israeli strikes, um, and um, Iraq is a sovereign country, and we don't we don't uh, we don't control Iraq's airspace. Talking of sovereignty, uh, I would like to talk about economy. I mean, Iraq's economy heavily relies on oil. Uh, oil revenues, and this is managed by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Is there, um, how do you see the future once there is a 360 relationship? How do you see this uh, relationship materializing, especially with all the current restrictions on Iraq's trade, sometimes with with Iran, I mean, we've seen recently Oman and UAE, uh, they can pay the Iranians the few billions that they uh, have or for, for, for trade, but Iraq always has uh, issues with the US Treasury over being able to pay Iran for, for energy uh, uh, subsidy or for energy for electricity, especially during, especially during the summer days. Uh, how do you see that relationship once we reach 360? Well, first of all, let me just point out um, the U.S. Treasury doesn't run Iraq's energy sector, nor do we run their economy. <laughs> I want to be really no, crystal so clear manage. about that. Um, uh, so I think to answer your, your question, uh, we have as part of our... Um, uh, efforts to activate the um, SFA uh, in the very first um, uh, HCC or the Higher um, uh, Consultative uh, uh, Council that we, we have under the SFA to kind of organize um, the work that we want to do, we made back in uh, very shortly after Prime Minister Sudani came um, to his position, 
we made um, uh, energy independence, energy autonomy, a very important element of, uh, of our work that we were going to do together. And that meant a number of things. Uh, first of all, it was making sure that the um, Iraqi government um, could uh, look at the resources that they have here in Iraq and make sure that they are used most efficiently. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important um, uh, components of that was to look at uh, capturing uh, flared yes. gas. Uh, we were very much um, encouraged by uh, the discussions that were going on with the French uh, company Total um, to help um, uh, build um, and included in their work was gas capture, was more efficient inf infrastructure. Um, and so that, so building, building Iraq's capacity to use its re own resources uh, was very important. But work between now and then, well, Iraq between now needs. and then, we've accomplished a lot on that. Um, it was also uh, working with um, uh, improving the electrical grid. Uh, you, need, you need a modern uh, uh, functioning grid in order to make sure that, you know, the Iraqi people don't experience the kinds of shortages that they've been... So we've done that, and we have one of our premier labs, uh, new, uh, the U.S. Pacific Northwest uh, Scientific Laboratory that's working on that aspect of it. So we have tried to tackle with um, the Ministry of Electricity, with the government of Iraq, ways in which that we can strengthen and build towards a more independent, uh, um, uh, self-sufficient uh, energy sector. My question was about us being able to pay Iran. There are some billions of dollars somewhere in some bank that uh, when you speak to the bankers or the finance people, they say, we cannot pay them because we will run the risk of being under sanctions by the well, US. Well, that's the answer. You've made, <laughs> you've made the, you've, you've given me my own answer, which I was going to say, which has to do with there are, uh, there are sanctions against Iran and I think those who want to either find, it, uh, find, uh, find ways to circumvent them or they find themselves violating sanctions will find themselves in real trouble. So how come Oman and UAE are not violating the sanctions by paying Iran? Well, well I'm not going to get into a lot of these details, okay. and the, sure. but suffice it to say that um, the way in which we uh, want to ensure that um, Iraq has a way to provide energy, electricity, uh, oil, uh, revenues from, the, from their very important sector is to have um, a modern, technically efficient uh, infrastructure and sector to include, you know, connections with, the, uh, with, uh, with their neighbors, which is Kuwait, Jordan, Saudi, there are there are ways in which they, we are harnessing that electrical grid in the region to help support uh, and, and help Iraq build its, um, its independence and its uh, sovereignty so that it doesn't have to find itself or have the unpleasant choice of violating those sanctions. Okay, so trade with everyone but Iran. Thank you. Uh, well, there are, there are ways that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the trade is allowed under uh, sanctions, and that has to do with the humanitarian um, assistance, and the Iranians know very well exactly what that means. Okay, because uh, yesterday, I think, there was the news that the dollar window will close by December of, of this year, in two months' time, and this has sent some alarm bells amongst the banking community as to how they will trade with dollars. Well, the banking, the, the banking reforms, and that actually has been one of the very positive things that has been going on over the last couple of years, and that is that, for, that, the, uh, that Iraq is now very much part uh, of building the kind of international banking sector that it should have if it wants to be really uh, a member of the international um, uh, economy and banks that um, have corresponding relationships in the international community 
uh, of course, with international banks. Um, they have, some of them have, uh, will have to restructure themselves, and there, it, there are definitely ways in which they will continue to be able to access dollars. Great. Uh, we move to the U.S. military presence. Again, it has been an issue that we hear, we hear about it a lot in Baghdad, not, not in Kurdistan. The Kurds welcome uh, the U.S. presence forever, actually. That's what I hear from them. Uh, when do you think, when we hear two stories, we hear from the American side that, yes, we will stay, we will not stay, but then we will hear, we hear from the Iraqis, some of them say complete withdrawal now, yesterday, and then others say, no, we, are, we need to be uh, more prepared. Is Iraq prepared for a complete withdrawal? I think, well, first of all, I, the, the, uh, the statement that both, the joint statement that was issued on September 27th about the transition of the um, coalition's uh, military mission in Iraq um, uh, in about a year, I think is a, is a recognition that the work that the coalition has been doing and the prospect for strengthening bilateral uh, security and defense relationships is um, a recognition that uh, the security forces in Iraq and frankly here in Iraqi Kurdistan have been making uh, progress to be able to continue the enduring defeat of ISIS, which is the mission of the coalition. That's why we were all invited here 10 years ago. Mm. Um, that. Um, uh, there is uh, there is a capability here that has uh, that has uh, improved and enhanced over time. The decision by the government of Iraq to uh, transition this into bilateral relationships, which many of our friends are here in the audience, is also a recognition that um, these security defense relationships are important. Uh, we expect to be able to continue working on the enduring defeat of ISIS. ISIS is not down and out, as we have seen recently, uh, but the steady pressure that uh, we can all uh, work together on and continue to build uh, the capabilities is a very good decision that was made. It's not, it, there are some who don't agree with it, but we are dealing with the government of Iraq, and those are the decisions that we've made together very much in a deliberative fashion over the past year. Uh, those who do not agree with it, we see them in, in various institutions, especially in Baghdad, not in Kurdistan, as people who are becoming more and more in control and powerful. Uh, how do you plan, I mean, as part of the transition to the complete withdrawal, if that to happen. How do you plan or how do you think the Iraqis should deal with those who are very much against the US and are closer to the other side in the conflict for Iraqis? And how should Iraqis deal or how do you, do you see them as a threat to a future bilateral relationship between Iraq and the United States? I, I think what um, our, our uh, discussions and our efforts with uh, the government of Iraq are very much um, in line uh, uh, to ensure that the security forces answer to the commander-in-chief of this country. Those who believe that they speak on behalf of the government, I think it has been very, made very clear by the prime minister himself that um, decisions about uh, the security of Iraq are wholly owned by the government. Our discussions um, and our decisions that we make together about the kind of defense relationship, uh, bilateral relationship we want to build will remain in discussion with the government. Uh, I myself am optimistic that we will be able to have um, the kind of 
defense and security relationship that was envisioned in the SFA and that frankly will also help Iraq build its, um, its security and uh, ties with the neighbors. Iraq is a very important um, country that will contribute to the stability of this region. And the more we can be um, a partner in doing that, uh, the, the, the better off Iraq will be in, in uh, achieving its stability and its security and, frankly, its own sovereignty. And that is a, a mutual goal that we are trying to achieve in, in our work that we're doing together in this transition and in building a future long-term relationship that we're both, that we are committed to. Some point in the past, I was an advisor to President Jalal Talabani, and I accompanied him in two visits, or many other visits, but I remember two visits distinctly, one in Tehran and one in DC, one to DC and one to Tehran. And he had one message to both sides. He said, we do not look at America with an Iranian eye, and we do not look at Iran with an American eye. Could you tolerate that today from Iraqis? I'm not sure what you're asking. Are we tolerating? It's a question. Iraq is a... Is well, a will the United States understand the Iraqi position of having a special relationship with Iran? and yet maintain a relationship, a healthy relationship with DC? Well, I think that, again, uh, Iraq is a, is a sovereign country, er, and it needs to shape its relations with Iran. It has a long history. It has economic ties. It has social ties. It has religious ties. Uh, we recognize that. What? Uh, we ourselves are trying to build stronger ties between um, Iraqis and Americans. Um, after 20 years of, more than 20 years of having um, uh, worked side by side um, on many of these issues and, and, um, and, you know, frankly spilling our blood together to make Iraq safe, uh, to make uh, Iraq stable, to make Iraq a democracy. Um, so I think that we are going to pursue the mutual interests that we have, uh, whether it's on security issues, on education, on, econ on building a private sector, on, on trade, um, on continuing to support um, Iraq's economic development. It has a lot of work that it needs to do on just, you know, make strengthening the business environment. So those are the areas where I think we will be concentrating um, and encouraging Iraq to work with us. Um, our position on Iran is not a surprise to anybody. Uh, so um, I would say right now the relationship that we have with Iraq is one that's moving forward on a lot of mutual interests. And, and it's a positive one, all in all. There are lots of challenges, lots of things we have to work through, but frankly, there are lots of challenges and lots of things that Iraq has to work through with many of the countries that would like to uh, be part of uh, strengthening their relationship with Iraq and the Iraqi people. Uh, on that note, can we move to Kurdistan? Sure. Uh, the city where we are in was hit twice with ballistic missiles. And both attacks were in close proximity to the new building, the new consulate building, or it flew over Erbil. Weren't you able to intercept these missiles as we see, as we saw when Iran was trying to hit Israel? You know, they, we are, you're right, we are building a very nice um, new mm -hmm. consulate, and we're very proud of uh, this new consulate. It is, uh, it, it is, I think, a real uh, um, testament to uh, our commitment to having uh, strong ties with the region and with, uh, 
and advance our relationship with, uh, with Kurdistan. Um, we are, um, as part of our um, work that we do on defense and security, it obviously very much includes um, uh, defending and supporting um, the security and defense uh, requirements of, uh, of, of this area. And uh, we're going to continue to be able to do that. I know, but the two attacks... And the two attacks... One was 1.4 kilometers away from that building, the second one that killed Peshra Dizay was 4.2 kilometers. We, in 964, we drew a Google map of the triangle, and it was amazing how we heard nothing from the U.S. consulate. Well, Usually I, we I, would the add, C-Rams. I would point out exactly who were the ones behind um, those attacks. Iran. Iran well, said. my point is they're a great neighbor. So what right. were they doing attacking the uh, um, uh, Kurdistan and those sites here? That's a big question. So if Iran attacks, it's up to the, or Turkey attacks, it's up to the Kurds. The U.S. has no... No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that, um, that you know, we are here, we defend, we have always, and, and for, since, uh, you know, we have always been defending um, U.S. Uh, personnel and U.S. Uh, U.S. facilities, but part of our our uh, future uh, defense discussions are going to be about how we have strong, uh, we, we, we build a strong uh, defense uh, for Iraq, if that's exactly what they are interested in doing. So if Iran wants to do something, now is the time, but they shouldn't attack U.S. personnel. They can well, we've made that else. very clear. We've made that very clear that, um, that anyone who, who attacks our personnel and our facilities we will, we will respond in self-defense. That has been very okay. clear, and we've said that very clearly Just publicly. Just U.S. personnel and facilities. That, that we are here to, we are, we, we are going to protect our facilities and our personnel. Thank you. Uh, final question. Uh, it's a Kurdish one, again. Uh, we often hear from the Kurdish leadership about a special relationship with the United States. And some analysts even call it a one-sided love story. Uh, <laughs> as the son of one of the very first Kurds who made contact with the United States back in the 70s, and I hear his disappointment afterwards in 1975, 88, 91, uh, and later. Uh, the question that is in the mind of every Kurd in the region, does Washington have a, have a Kurdish policy? Do they see the Kurds as Kurds or they see them as good Iraqi citizens, good Syrian citizens? good Turkish citizens and good Iranian citizens? Well, first of all, when you say it's a one-sided love affair, I would disagree with you. <laughs> I would say it's a two-sided love affair. Um, and we have... Um, Is it? Well, I, I know that the United States, first of all, has this very strong commitment and a very strong pr presence but and have done a lot of work question. You just here said in, we were hit in, twice. In, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And we have, we have um, you know, in, in many ways, uh, I, I, Iraqi Kurdistan has been the beachhead for so many American businesses to come in and establish their foothold in investment, not just in Kurdistan, but also in Iraq. Um, they have uh, invested here and some of the, and the investments have done very well to the point where it allows them to go in. Some of our franchises started here and are now in Baghdad and other places. Um, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan has really demonstrated uh, that uh, democracy um, is, it can be strong. Look, the elections that just happened uh, uh, on October 20th, I mean, they were, they were lively and spirited like most elections are. But at the end of the day, um, uh, it, it was a huge turnout, what, 72, 74%. Yeah. 
Um, I think, you know, uh, that is a really strong model for the election. Do you have a Kurdish policy or an Iraqi policy? We have, we have an Iraqi policy, and, and Kurdistan is, is, is part of oh. Iraq. But it doesn't mean that, you know, we also don't have our relationship, our special aspects of our relationship with Iraqi Kurdistan as we do with other parts of Iraq. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.